City. We have 12 great founders, uh, companies that we are uh, funding and putting through the programming here. Uh, industry agnostic, really focused on just supporting entrepreneurship, supporting early stage startups, uh, particularly here in Brooklyn. So we have people who are from Brooklyn or want to be in Brooklyn, um, and particularly those with BIPOC founders. So that's PKXL. Um, I am joined, as I mentioned, by J.B. Lockhart, uh, who is currently the CFO at 824, uh, previously was uh, CFO at the NBA, uh, and did a bunch of interesting things before that. So I will, uh, yeah, I'd love to just, here, let me come a little closer. But uh, yeah, I'd love for you to just, um, you know, maybe give everyone in the room uh, a little background on yourself. I know you spent some time with venture capital. Obviously, many, if not most of the people in this room run early stage startups, so I'm sure that'd be interesting to them. Um, and yeah, just give us a little background on sort of who you are and sort of how you got to where you are today. Sure, well, thank you for having me. It's nice to meet all of you. Um, uh, so yeah, I can quickly start. Um, I started off in tech media investment banking a long time ago in New York um, and made my way to Disney strategy group, uh, where I spent a lot of time on M&A, but also early stage uh, um, digital technologies and how um, the entertainment landscape was kind of transforming over time. This is back in the, I guess at that point, like uh, early 2000s, uh, early mid 2000s. Um, I, I really enjoyed that experience, um, but I kind of wanted to get a little bit more of experience in early stage side, I almost started a company. I, uh, I looked at um, start, uh, joining a few companies, um, ended up actually going to a venture capital fund that was based here in New York, so I moved back from LA to New York, um, that was one of only a few really venture funds in New York at that time. It was, uh, it was affiliated with Green Hill, and uh, it was about a $100 million early stage uh, venture capital fund that you know, focused on kind of the gamut of technology-enabled services, a lot of advertising technology, marketing technology, digital media, e-commerce, fintech, things like that. Um, thought that was an incredible experience, really enjoyed it, um, but I always kind of had the itch to like, get to the operating side, back to the operating side, um, and, uh, and then I had the opportunity just through someone who I had known earlier in my career to join the MBA. And, um, and I started off in a role at the MBA um, on uh, overseeing kind of strategy and finance for the teams, where I got to know the folks at the, the Nets, actually helped sell the team to the, the folks in the Nets, Joe Sai, and, um, uh, and um, which is, they're an incredible group of people. But, um, and then kind of moved my way to the CFO role. Um, you know, it's a fascinating organization overall. I'm really enjoying it. Um, Great product. I think of all the sports league is probably the most kind of like progressive and, and digitally oriented, kind of innovative of the sports leagues. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, you know, it was a point in my career where I was basically looking. I thought if I didn't do something a little bit more entrepreneurial, like I probably wouldn't do it at that point. And um, and A24, which I don't know, I can talk a little bit about A24. Came kind of knocking my door. I've done a lot of media, uh, obviously in entertainment throughout my career, um, and it's a growth stage company. So um, not a startup, but a growth stage company. But I think it was on the cusp of something very interesting. They built kind of a very unique um, business within the entertainment landscape, and so decided kind of to join A24 a few years ago. It's been a lot of fun. Brought on um, Joe Sides Group again to be in one of the investors in uh, A24 and. Uh, there, which I'm happy to talk about later as well. But anyway, so that's my, my quick background. Yeah, and so um, that's great. So I'm curious, like in your sort of in your position, uh, you know, whether it was with the NBA previously or with A24 now. So sort of, you mentioned sort of you know TNT banking and you worked in DC. Had you you know what, did you have interactions with? Because I'm just imagining you know the NBA for example made a lot of startup investments. Were you working on those and, and now through sort of in your you know, in your capacity at 824, and maybe you can sort of educate me and educate us on how like that business works and sure. film financing things like that. Is that do you look at sort of startups uh, at all through that, uh, that job now? Yeah, definitely. So let's go back to the MBA first of all. Um, when I when I came over to the MBA, one of those that was one of the areas I was going to focus on. I think 
but it, was, it turned out to be less time, but became you know an important aspect of uh, of what I did in the MBA. We, um, I, I think, it is really important for you know companies, bigger companies, to stay abreast of trends. And one of the best ways to do it is to you know understand what's being built at the, at the ground level. Um, the MBA had through its team owners. Many people who are involved in venture capital, many people have been entrepreneurs, um, and so some of them pushed actually for us to invest in early stage companies. Some actually said it was a bad idea; the corporation should not invest in early stage companies, and you know, it's good for partnerships but not to invest. Um, we also had players. The players, it's kind of you know, a, a real trend among players that um, kind of the more high profile players they get involved. These a lot of them start their funds. Um, they invest in, in uh, companies as well. And so, and, and, you know, the MBA and sports league are kind of like at a unique, unique position where they're a bit of king, a kingmaker for a certain type of company. Um, so we did, we did invest in a, in a number of companies. Um, we saw a lot, we, I will say that most corporations aren't really built to invest very well though. You just don't have the right like infrastructure, you don't have the right, um, you don't have the right incentives really internally. Like, you know, people aren't, Really incentivize like they are in venture capital to make investments to help out a company. There's, you know, there's always like a commercial aspect to it usually, which can get complicated. So if it works, it can work really well. It can also be a lot of waste for, for a early stage company and for a corporation too. Um, but we, we we invested in a bunch of interesting companies. One, um, some of them that were, you know, I think when I was there, about ten companies. Um, they've done more since because when I was leaving, they actually made more of a formalized program to do it. More, uh, you know. Kind of higher volume companies, but we uh, we invested in FanDuel. Um, we invested in a whole bunch of digital technology companies, including um, one called NextVR, which is kind of a, a VR events based company that sold to Apple. Um, one that does digital clipping, one that does kind of visual AI. Um, we did a we did some on kind of like the medical tech side, um, on, on like massages, like their therapy guns and things like that. So it was like a, it was all over East Asia. So it was like it was all over. Um, but uh, we also we also did incubation too. So we we we, um, we started a esports league with Take Two as a joint venture. Um, we started an Africa League, which is an obviously very tech oriented, but was like a really we thought it was an incredible opportunity. We thought it was a totally underserved market, and, and a, you know you could become a very strong brand there. There were lots of incredible players, um, and so we did a lot of incubation. So, 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 so I do think it was, it's, I think it actually is really, really important for corporations to stay abreast of like on these, these trends, these really safe trends. A24, so A24, it was, is it, first of all, it's a film and TV entertainment company. Um, it was started about 11 years ago with some gross, uh, some early state, or I'm sorry, some uh, seed capital. Um, and then it didn't actually raise another equity round until two, or a year and a half ago. Basically, right after I came, um, and because it was able to, the nice thing about the film business is you can actually build a business. If you, if you if you don't have a lot of major flops, you can actually build it through debt financing. It's a pretty efficient market. Um, but uh, but but when they started the business originally, you know they had kind of like three trends were in mind. At that time, um, there were a lot of new players in the ecosystem buying content. So Netflix, Amazon, Apple. Um, they had, uh, they thought, saw an opportunity, which has been kind of a very important part of A24, which is you can kind of do non-traditional marketing at a much cheaper, uh, much more efficiently, um, do it through social media, innovative, authentic marketing campaigns. Sometimes they, to, what we do, we develop product and merch actually. They kind of had as like, it becomes more part of the marketing. Um, so they saw this like opportunity there where you weren't like spending on, you know, TV and, and billboards and stuff like that, where a lot of money is kind of spent in Hollywood. Um, and uh, the third thing was that they saw a lot of really incredible talent that wasn't being picked up, and upcoming filmmakers that hadn't really, there hadn't been as good of a market for that. And so they, so they started just, start out by acquiring and distributing films, like basically films that were done. Then over time, um, they start producing and finance, financing and producing films, so making the films with the filmmaker. 
And uh, the first one they did there was Moonlight, which won Best Picture. And uh, so it was a good one to start on. And then now we're up to, we're producing something like about 15 films a year. Um, we're we're going into TV, so we have a whole bunch of TV shows. We're doing, I think, somewhere about seven to 10 TV shows a year now. Um, Euphoria, Beef, which is one that just came out. Um, and, uh, and then, but at the core of it, as I mentioned, like one of the kind of the key things was was to, to also create a consumer brand, which I think is an interesting, if you have any consumer-based company, it's like an interesting thing because it is a true differentiation. And that's one of the reasons why I was attracted to A24. It's one of the few entertainment companies. I, I learned this from Disney and from the yeah, NBA. Yeah, it's like the importance of kind of a consumer brand is such an incredible quote if you can create it. And it's like, a, and to create it in such an authentic way, it's absolutely, I think it's key. Um, so anyway, so, 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 so anyway, fast forward. We, we actually do have, in the, in our like DNA, kind of like an early stage mentality, very like digitally oriented. So we, we have, we don't have nearly as much capital <laughs> as the NBA, so we don't invest and we, we, we have to be very like focused with where we make our bets. Um, we, we have incubated some things, so for instance, we just um, we founded a company with um, it's a cosmetic makeup company um, with the, the lead makeup artist on uh, Euphoria, and she also worked with us on a number of other uh, films. Um, it's a quick makeup company called Half Magic, and just launched. Um, and we actually brought in a few kind of consumer products from VCs to join in. Um, that's been a really interesting experience. We just think there's an interesting way to kind of like evolve out our brand in different ways and work with great talent. And at the core of 824 is like putting talent first and like and making sure we can serve them in any way we can, right? Um, so that's one thing. We have made some investments. We, recently made an investment in a music uh, company called Gamma, which was uh, started by Larry Jackson from Apple. And um, so it's also, it's a, you know, it's like creation, distribution, but also just serving, it's got a very similar like philosophy as ours, like how do you serve the, the artist in like as many ways as you can. And I, I think there's gonna be a lot of overlap between what we can do, they can do, we, we, have a, we do work with a lot of musicians. But by the way, like, the creative community just seems like a trend where and I think you probably see the tech community too, where it's like innovative people like to go across different media. They like to be like, you know, and you learn a lot from different things. So we, we do work with musicians. Um, the Weekend is in a new show we have coming out. Um, and we have like, it, so, so we work with a bunch of musicians and then, you know, I think, you know, actors like to go over that side as well. And it's, it, it's just, you kind of see the world's wide fashion, music, um, you know, video games, all these things are kind of like colliding a little bit, and, and you know, great artists like to tell stories across different media. So, the, so we do tow it in different areas. One thing, we, this is a New York crowd, this is, I don't know if this is as much of a, like gonna be a great business, but it's like kind of an interesting kind of, I think it would be a great forum and um, uh, kind of a community. We bought the Cherry Lane Theater, which is in the West Village, which is the oldest off-Broadway theater in New York, and it's, um, and it's having its hundredth year anniversary this year. Um, we're gonna we're renovating it, and uh, it's gonna be it's gonna still have live theater, but it's also gonna have um, we're gonna make it a theater, like a movie theater as well. We're gonna put in some you know kind of a, a bar slash restaurant in there and kind of make it a community. A lot of our like filmmakers they want to like showcase their town, their their stuff, and then, and so it just seemed like kind of a cool like you know way to organize. I don't you know talent and like also you know kind of save an institution. Um, you know, I don't think it's going to be a huge money maker on its own, to be honest, as the SCFO. I'm like, okay, I mean, this is great. We have to really think about the overall brand, like how you're serving the, um, you know, who our ultimate, like, you know, source of innovation is, who is the, the talent from our side. Anyway, so that was a long winded answer. But, like, we do, we do tow it in. And I guess on the 24 side, since we don't have a lot of, like, excess capital to do in these, like, other areas, what we, we do like kind of toe dipping in areas to see where there might be opportunities to extend our brand, for instance, we're going to serve different things. Yeah, okay. Yeah, there was, there was a, that was excellent. There was a lot there, a lot of sort of different ways I could take this. I actually had forgotten the invested in FanDuel. We had uh, a couple weeks ago, Matt King. Oh, yeah. He's now yeah. You know, building sports book at yeah. Fanatics. Fanatics, which is uh, incredible. <laughs> he's a great guy. He was actually the CFO of Fanatics. I don't know if Fanduel okay. before you. Know, yeah. Right, before you. He's, 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 he's a great guy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he, he's really good, and uh, and yeah, I mean, Fanatics is just an incredible business. Like that, that business in terms of what they built is amazing. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Well, uh, I guess on that topic of being a CFO, right? I mean, it seems like you know, through the MBA and now at, at A24, uh, you're sort of, I mean, these are media brands. You, you mentioned this is sort of the building a consumer brand, which I want to get back to because I think it's a really interesting, uh, interesting thing to dive into. But I guess first, like, you know, in your role as a CFO, as you've sort of been in finance and been a CFO, like, how do you view, especially within the context of these media companies where you know, really, I think both is like the talent, right, is the core <laughs> of the yeah. product, right? How do you view your role? I mean, a lot of people, I think, would say, oh, like a CFO, they're just kind of like, you know, bean counting, managing members, like the, the sort of, like, how do you influence strategy and how do you think about, um, you know, your, your, how you work with either each of those businesses to sort of drive the strategic direction? Yeah, it's a good question. I think that, um, yeah, I mean, there are definitely businesses where you know CFO is like purely focused on accounting, the bookkeeping, or, or budgeting, um, and those are all very important rules. I think in general, if you look at most companies now, the CFO has kind of evolved from a more strategic role. And it's, it's it's natural because um, you know you have, like as part of budgeting, you're making capital decisions about where you need to invest your time and resources, right? And so. Um, whether it's organic, inorganic growth, um, and where you source that capital. And so, as a result, I mean, I think the it's very natural for the CFO to have a, a big strategic influence. By the way, I think everyone in the company really should be involved in strategy. You know, from I mean, like you know, in terms of how they think about how the company should evolve and maximize value. Um, so I think fundamentally, you know, it's a natural thing that you know you see in many companies the CFOs. Very involved, right? Now there are. There, I do. I've noticed like bigger companies. There's like there can be power grabs between like who owns strategy, and, and it, it is it is kind of funny. It becomes like one of those things that people toss around. But um, but again, I think ultimately people, the CEO obviously ultimately um, runs the strategy. But there's so many other ways you have to contribute to other lens to look at. From a creative role, it's actually interesting. Creative industries, um, and and also I do think this overlaps with a lot of tech industries too, where um. The key balance is, from a CFO's perspective, is not um, like ruining the product. <laughs> I say this way. So, so um, you have to be very careful um, to not make financial decisions that ultimately harm the product, right? And there's a lot of um, there's a lot of like uh, from a CFO's perspective where you're like trying to like hit your numbers or like make these capital decisions. There's a lot of pressure to um, make some kind of, some of the short-term financial decisions um, that might not be best for the product overall. And you see it's very much in the creative industry where you know sometimes it's like a completely different world of thinking um, in terms of like you know you're on the, the creative, you're making this product, and you know, obviously it's very hard to define what is that product going to be, how how good that product's going to be. It's kind of you know when you see it in some ways, and so like. The incentive to either like spend a little bit more on you know, the via VFX of a, of a film, or to push the release date back three months because it's a better slot. Like it's like oh boy, like that costs real money, you know that kind of thing. So you you have to first of all build a very trusted relationship. I think with the creatives as much as possible. Um, on the on the flip side, where film companies usually get. Out of, Film and, and I think other, I think probably tech companies too, where they run a foul is when the CFO has like no influence or doesn't like doesn't like assert themselves at all, right? So like there's a lot of film companies that gone because they've gone, you know, they've given full reins to a creative down and it just has been kind of misplaced. So you, so I think it's partially working with talent that understands the broader the broader picture that you know that actually like understands budgets and timelines and the importance of those types of things. And at the same point, trusting that talent as well. So it, it's, just, it's finding that right balance, which is very difficult to do. Um, I would say that the one, one insight that I had had from A24, which I think is, is, I didn't really buy into it, but I now buy into it, is that we, we actually have, we tend to do like smaller big budget films, right? And, um, and we're actually very disciplined in our budgeting. And we, we will push back and not like let cost control go, go. I mean, there are cases where things do push a little bit. 
but the thing is, like, we're pretty disciplined in our budget, and and we also kind of like, um, and I don't know if there's insights into other businesses by doing this, but we kind of we kind of swing for singles and doubles, not for home runs. And what that does is, I thought like creative talent would not like that, but what it does when they when you start to realize this, it actually gives them the freedom to be a little take a little bit more creative risk because they're not having to solve for the general population, right? You can so, you can solve for like what their vision is. And for like specific, you know, area, you know, whether it's specific audience, et cetera, and it allows them to take more creative risk. And I think you know, what A twenty four has been very good at doing is like, if you look at most of our projects, they actually are like there is some creative risk in them. There's like an edge there. Sometimes it doesn't work, but oftentimes it does. And it's really that kind of like the, you know, the vision of the creator who's kind of come through. And so I, I don't know whether there's a lesson there for. You know other types of especially tech businesses, but I think there probably is. They're like not trying to solve everything or hit the home run, where you take an incremental approach to things. It's kind of like that. It sometimes can like lead to a kind of a a more more risk that's like created and actually can have a bigger breakthrough. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's really interesting. That the idea that it gives the you know a little bit more breathing room, right? For creatives, they, they don't feel like they have to swim through the fence. They have to solve for, and you know, they don't need to. Build the next uh, you know, Avengers <laughs> film or whatever. Right? Um, that was interesting. So I guess I, I'd love for you to because the, the, I feel like the businesses are similar in some ways, but very different in many ways, right? In terms of like exactly the type of product they produce and especially the stage of company between the NBA and A twenty four. I'd love for you to just like compare and contrast a little bit of you know like what the job entails and, and specifically talk about sort of you mentioned that. You know, when you left the NBA, you were looking to do something more entrepreneurial. Yep. And so, you know, how, how does how is the job different now, and what excites you about being at sort of a more growth stage company? Sure, I'd say the the NBA is incredible, and so um, because it's such a large and powerful organization, um, it has access to everyone, right? So that's that's I mean, you just can't beat that. And actually, having been on the flip side of negotiating with a major sports league. Um, recently, you realize how little power you have when <laughs> you're like negotiating something with a large, you know, a large institution like that. And same thing with you know the large media tech companies too. Like, you know, we're a little bit more valuable to say a Netflix or Apple just because there's only so many content providers that are. Uh, uh, but um, so there, you know, there, and there's a long-term relationship. But when you're negotiating like a sports league where you might not be interacting with all the time, like you really don't have much leverage in the negotiation. Um, I will say. The, um, the the thing that was interesting about the NBA is so the board is which I spent a lot of time you know the CFO role you end up spending a lot of time with the board um, is there, it's a sixty person board so two team owners for each team so Joe Sai you know so exactly and they're impressive people to say the least um, and so but it doesn't make for a very nimble organization right and so that plus you have an interesting structure where all the the board members are kind of competing against each other, <laughs> trying to win on the court. Um, and there's other things like you have you know, players. There's a unionized player group, so you're you're definitely in lockstep with them many times. But you're oftentimes not because there's different economics, um, you know, incentives as well. And then um, and so and then there's a whole like system of revenue sharing between the teams too, which is the larger teams basically share revenue with the smaller teams to make it more of an equitable thing. So you have a very like kind of like very structured like organization that I think the NBA handles very well in terms of it is I think the most nimble I'd say of the sports leagues, but you can't be that nimble just because of all those like different things. Um, and so uh, in some ways it's like a little mini government. You have know, like states, federal, it's like it, so it's actually it's really it's 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 it kind of it's an interesting kind of organization from that standpoint. Um, being at a smaller company, obviously you're far more nimble. We just, you know, with our most recent capital raise, um, we uh, you know established a more formal board. We now have board of the board meetings. I would say I know for early stage companies, one, one takeaway in, like board meetings are actually very painful. <laughs> I'd say in general, but um, you can get a lot out of them, and I think they're actually very important. And if you don't have a board at this point. You should try to institute processes internally that make you feel like you have a board. That are like, you know, because I, I actually find it is a very helpful, helpful mechanism 
just to like, like kind of like set on like a quarterly basis. We, we obviously have a lot more communication than a quarterly basis with them, but like, but like you're like looking at KPIs, you're looking at like how you're doing, you're like assessing like is this working or not working. And you kind of like it's a forcing mechanism for that, and I feel like you can kind of waste time and resources and go off off on different paths if you don't have that kind of forcing mechanism. So actually, I think there is something very useful to that. Um, that said, it's a much more like kind of nimble structure now. Um, the the other kind of like quick takeaway is that it's it's, you know, it's very well, actually there's a few here. So one is um, communication is key across any size organization. I really view that and an insight that I've had is that you know it is a very large organization, especially we add all the teams, the players, etc. Um, and communication, you know, you know, you have every every organization has communication issues internally to make sure people are on the same page. But sometimes in early stage companies or growth stage companies, communication can actually break down even more so because everyone's just focused on executing so much in their own lane that you kind of need to have some mechanism like centralization of data and, and, and a communication mechanism to make sure people are kind of rowing in the same direction. But, and the last insight just randomly is that like, which you don't get quite as much of an insight from a large organization is how important cash is. <laughs> Which I know you all probably um, appreciate that, but you know, cash is obviously the life, lifeblood of a, of, a, of a earlier stage company, and you know I, I do think it's very important. Same thing with like the, the budgeting and the board processing. We we'll have a thirteen week cash flow look. We look at it every week. You know, we update it, make sure that we have enough cash. Like we and we're well capitalized, but like we have enough cash and we anticipate issues and where they might go. And so I, I do think that's obviously a pretty fundamental insight, but um, in a large organization, you're thinking about like bigger picture, like a allocation of capital, but like, you know, there is a fundamental one, I think, I'm like, the, there are other things like, you know, what kills an organization, the company is that they run out of cash, more so than anything else, right? And so, um, just being focused on that, you know, all the time, and how you're, you know, how you can generate cash, or if you need to get ahead of it, like, you need to capital raise, things like that. And so for, I mean, with A24 being sort of an earlier stage, a growth stage company, obviously cash is extraordinarily important. But as you think about sort of the, the mid to long term of you know, this business, I'd love to sort of, you know, what, what got you sort of, ex like paint a picture for us of, you know, what got you excited to join it as you thought about, you know, like five it's years, it's 10 years down the road, where it could be? And, I, and maybe we can tie in this idea that, that I wanted to get back to from earlier. This was a very interesting insight that you said, like, the idea of sort of building a consumer brand, yeah. and how like I'd love to understand sort of how you thought about that, especially with your experience in the MBA and why that was important. How did you assess that you know, K24 seems to be sort of starting to build a real durable consumer brand? Yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, so this was one of the so I when A24 kind of like approached me, um, you know, I like the I knew the product, great reputation. I met the folks; they're great people. They're very like not Hollywood. They're, they're very understated. Um, and uh, so I like the, the, the culture. It's actually got a very tech culture, too, in the sense that it's like all of them. It's not Hollywood, it's very much like in general, but it's like, you know, corner offices, fancy stuff. This is, it's not what 824 is at all. Um, but, uh, but, the, but the thing that was, you know, very appealing to me was the fact that they had a consumer brand. It was a, it's not a big consumer brand. I'm sure many of you have never heard of it. Um, but it is, it is, I think probably the only entertainment company that really comes to mind to me outside the Disney suite of companies um, that has a consumer brand, and which is truly unique in entertainment. Um, and uh, and you know the way it builds as is like these authentic. I think working with great talent, a lot of our our projects are kind of repeat collaborations or referrals from talent. Kind of tr you know I think working well with the talent, giving them you know an opportunity to kind of voice their stories. Um, and it's kind of a very authentic um, way to interact with our audience. And so, so, so what excites me about it is you obviously have to continue to push out very good content. Um, but there's a lot, once you have a brand, you can take it in a lot of different ways. And that's like that's kind of the exciting part right now. We're trying to figure that out. So on the film side, there's you know there's only so many films the market only has like potential for so many films. Now we're going slightly larger films. We're still keeping like the same like folks of quality and, and kind of you know, interesting voice, but um, we're going slightly larger films. TV, there's actually a lot more capacity in the market. 
just like there's there's more volume, so there's a lot of growth in that area, and there's a lot of international growth. There's certain categories we haven't gone into uh, that we could theoretically go into, but you 